So it may seem surprising to us today that medieval people believed in and practiced magic. It may seem odd to us that a deep religious, uh, mostly Catholic society believed in the supernatural, in demons, occult forces, astrology, divination, and even necromancy. It wasn't even a belief that was confined to a small number of individuals or just to one level of society or gender. It was ubiquitous in medieval society. It permeated every aspect of life. Documentary sources have proven this, and archaeological evidence is now being reassessed with an eye for ritual and the occult. There were many different types of magic in the Middle Ages, one of which was love magic. My interest in love magic began over 10 years ago, I'm showing my age, when I was studying for my masters. My dissertation looked at the material culture of medieval love. And although I didn't explicitly discuss love magic, a connection between love and the supernatural kept emerging. Since then, archaeologists have started to explore medieval magic further in the archaeological record. But the subject of love magic has not yet been sufficiently explored. I find this surprising in, in some ways, as love magic is thought to have been one of the most common types of uh, later medieval magic. The 15th century Malleus Maleficarum states that love magic was the most common form of witchcraft. But if it was so common, where is the archaeological evidence for its practice? Love magic and magic in general has largely been avoided by medieval archaeologists because it smacks of superstition. As, as a discipline, medieval archaeology is younger than the study of prehistoric or Roman archaeology. For a long time it was in the shadows, often described as the handmaiden of history, and as a result strove to cleave its own path away from historical methodologies and theoretical thinking. The study of ritual outside of preconceived ideals of medieval Christian liturgy was avoided in order for the discipline to be taken more seriously. This notion is further compounded for love magic, which deals with much more personal, and some might say uh, embarrassing, uh, themes such as sexual desire and impotence. My research, which is still in a formative stage, like Alice's, um, strives to rectify this situation. My paper today will first consider what medieval uh, love magic was and give some background to its study before then going on to consider how archaeologists might access it through the study of material culture. So first, some definitions. The historian Richard Kiekefer defines medieval magic as the intersection between religion and science. There are two main categories. First, demonic magic, which invoked evil spirits and rested upon a network of religious beliefs and practices. And secondly, there was natural magic, which exploited occult powers within nature. These two categories of magic intermingled so that, for example, a medical cure could use both herbal law from folk medicine and phrases from Christian liturgy. Medieval magic was also an area where popular culture met learner culture and where humour and seriousness also converged. Love magic can be defined as the rituals employed for a variety of purposes connected to love, sex and reproduction in the Middle Ages. These rituals were often performed in order to affect sexual arousal or love, or to impede it by causing hatred or impotence. Love magic was occasionally used to predict the identity of future spouses and to help or impede conception of a child. An example of love magic can, can be found in this uh, manuscript from the British Library. It tells us how to make a lead ring on the day and at the hour when Venus is dominant. After making the ring, one should fast through the day then go out at night and offer sacrifice with the blood of a dove. Writing with this blood on the skin of a hair, one should inscribe the name and sign of the angel Abba After this ceremony has been carried out, one should approach the desired woman with the ring in hand and she will obey one's every wish. So magic is a popular area of scholarship for medieval historians. Historians focus on learned magic that was written down in magic and scientific manuals, medieval healing treatises, herbal recipes, and uh, lapidaries. Catherine Ryder's study of pastoral manuals, which were guidelines written down for clergymen to teach them how to preach, hear confession, and conduct pastoral care, has been especially useful in the study of medieval love magic, especially in re-evaluating gender roles in its practice and questioning the assumption that love magic was a women's sphere of the occult. As the study of the history of medieval magic is well established and extensive, 
the study of its archaeology is still in a formative stage. Ralph Merrifield was the first archaeologist to seriously consider the material evidence for ritual magic in Britain. Audrey Meany was also another pioneer using evidence of grave goods to identify the burials of Anglo-Saxon cunning women. However, it has been Roberta Gilchrist's 2008 article, Magic for the Dead, as well as her 2012 Medieval Life book, that has given real credence to the archaeological studies of later medieval magic in particular. Whilst historians have studied the magic written down in texts that would have only been accessible to a high-status elite and literate ecclesiastics, archaeologists have access to magic of more popular nature, magic practised every day, by mostly illiter illiterate men and women in the home, at work, in church and in the graveyard. Archaeology is able to access spheres of magical practice that textual sources cannot. Archaeological interest in agency overlaps with the focus on causation in the study of medieval magic, the rationale that allowed medieval people to associate the cause of marvels to the intercession of saints, the occult power of nature or the intervention of demons. Similarly, archaeology is concerned with materiality has close affinities with natural magic, that different materials could, had occult powers that could be harnessed for good or ill. The archaeology of magic has also the potential to explore the relationship between magic, gender and the body. Objects found associated with the body provide evidence for the embodied experience of ritual practice that is rarely seen in text. Archaeologists are able to consider the long durée of magical practice we work at larger chrono chronological uh, scales to most historians. This extended timescale can reveal continuity of ritual practice, crossing pivotal periods and events such as the Christian conversion and the Reformation. But what of the archaeological study of love magic? There's a growing literature on the material culture of medieval love, but little explicit discussion of love magic. However, from my initial investigations, I've identified several types of objects where the practices of medieval courtly love, romantic gift giving between a man and a woman, had me and medieval magic collided. Rings were popular lovers' gifts and gifts of betrothal in the Middle Ages. It is thought that rings were exchanged at the church door during betrothal ceremonies. They were first blessed and then placed on the right hand of the bride. One type of ring that may have been used in this way are fedo rings. These are rings that are formed by two clasped hands and were sometimes inscribed with abbreviations for the names of Christ, the Virgin, and the Saints. Similarly, annular uh, brooches or ring brooches were popular pieces of jewellery from the 12th century onwards, because their circular shape fitted the geometrical theory of beauty, undisputed by angles, and thus represented an unbroken testimony of faith and undying love. This concept was often strengthened by inscriptions. They were another popular gift exchange between lovers and could have been worn over the breast and heart. Roberta Gilchrist and Eleanor Stanley have highlighted the use of sacred names for healing and protective purposes. Such objects were part of the medieval popular tradition of textual amulets and charms. The inscription of holy words transformed objects into charms that were worn on the body or kept in the home to confer protection, good fortune and healing. Therefore, when a magical or ritual connection is recorded on what I'm going to call love material culture, such an inscription on a betrothal ring. It is usually described as apotropaic, a lucky charm to protect the wearer from harm. But what sort of harm? Why would such an inscription be considered appropriate for a love token of all things? Currently, there seems to be little understanding amongst most archeologists of the historiography of medieval magic that might help to inform our interpretations of love material culture. Can we be more specific about the purpose behind occult forces being evoked on such objects and place such interpretation within the wider <coughs> literature of medieval magic. Were such lovers tokens inscribed with invocations to harness the occult power of the heavens in order to bless and protect the union of two lovers, to ensure a loving, fertile and long-lasting marriage? This is something yet to be determined. <laughs> so the second type of object that I would like to consider are uh, profane badges that have been found across Western Europe. I should have given a warning really, shouldn't I? Um, these badges are usually made from lead tin alloy and depict a myriad of sexual scenes in quite humorous situa uh, situations. And I would uh, warn people, um, do not put pussy goes a hunting into Google. <laughs> Just putting that out there. Dating from around 1350 to 1500, 
The majority <coughs> have been found in the Netherlands uh, shelled estuary, but they've also been recovered from the riv riverbanks of the Seine in France and from the Thames in England. The few scholars who have attempted their study have labelled them as erotic, obscene, rude, naughty and pornographic. Academic reactions to these objects have been mixed. They have variously been interpreted as parodies of popular um, religious devotion, so appearing to make fun of pilgrims, for example. But the only real consensus reached is that badges broadly functioned as apotropaic devices. One scholar even suggests they could have been used as a protection against the Black Death. However, I would argue that these conclusions have been drawn because scholars have not known what to make of these quite confronting objects. They just don't fit into modern preconceived conceptions of the medieval world. Work on these badges has focused on their iconography, conducted mostly by art historians and folklorists. Little consideration has been given to the context that the badges are found in. When fine context is known, the vast majority, if not all, are found in rivers. These badges are usually also usually found alongside their better known counterparts, pilgrim badges. So pilgrim badges have been studied quite comprehensively by archaeologists. Mm. However, the same cannot be said for the Provane badges, which have largely been avoided. A couple of exceptions are Brian Spencer and Visser Ummerman. However, once again, the badges iconography is the focus <coughs> of interpretation and is either deemed too graphic to dwell on or understood as didactic, seen through a modern day lens. The fact that the badges have been found in river contexts seems to detract a little in their interpretation. This may be because archaeologists are con uh, conscious of preservation bias, which led to allow badges best survive in anaerobic waterlogged conditions. Nevertheless, Spencer and others have factored into their analyses of pilgrim badges the watery locations that they've been found in. The main consensus seems to be that, mo that some pilgrim badges were deliberately thrown into rivers as a good luck gesture or as an act of thanks after returning safely from pilgrimage. Spencer even acknowledges that few pilgrim badges have been found on inland sites, even in circumstances favourable to their survival. Pilgrim souvenirs often acted as a surrogate relic, attributed with the same protective and cur uh, curative properties as the saint. Through direct physical contact with the relic or shrine, the healing or apotropaic power of the saint was transferred to the souvenir. Pilgrim souvenirs were worn on clothing, usually in highly visible places, such as on a hat, and they've been found deposited in graves as well as found in great numbers in rivers. So when you compare pilgrim badges and profane badges, um, some obvious similarities appear. They're made in the same way, they're made in the same materials, and they're found in the same locations, and I would argue that they were made, probably made by the same craftsmen and were probably used in the same way. Secular badges were sold at saint shrines alongside pilgrim badges and a range of other devotional objects. Jean Gearson in the 13th to 14th, 14th, 13th, 14th century <laughs> complained of shameless and naked images for sale in churches and during church festivals. He is probably alluding to the various ex votos produced as vot votive offerings, but could also be referring to profane badges. Considering then the use of pilgrim badges as surrogate relics, could profane badges have been used in a similar manner? Could they have been worn and then deposited in rivers as part of love magic practices, as a charm to enhance fertility, cure impotence, or ask for a happy marriage? Alternatively, could profane badges have had a more sinister purpose? The Malleus Maleficarum repeatedly reports of the greatly feared loss of male fertility. It records that sexual organs could be detached from their rightful owners, bewitched and hidden, for example, in a bird's nest where they move like living beings, feeding on corn and other nourishment. This image is reminiscent of the winged phallic badges depicted here. A connection with love magic is very difficult to prove, of course, and requires more consideration. But the current ignorance and lack of understanding of profane badges needs to be addressed. And I would argue that their study would benefit from integration with the wider, more established and extensive literature on pilgrim badges. Before concluding, I want to quickly consider one final type of material culture in my archaeological study of medieval love magic. Sheila gigs are stone representations of the naked human female form graphically displaying her genitalia and broadly date from the 12th to 17th centuries. They occur across Britain and Ireland 
and they've been found externally on churches, often above doorways or to the side of window arches, on towers uh, and castles, on medieval town walls, occasionally associated with gates and pillars, and found dumped in rivers. There are many similarities between the study of shilas and the study of profane badges. The shilas have also been largely ignored by archaeologists, probably due to their sexual iconography. They challenge categorization within a Christian context. And so when they have been studied, they have been seen as a pagan skewermorph, demonized and seen in terms of filling an only a didactic or apotropaic function. However, could the shilas represent another form of material culture linked with medieval magic? Could their appearance on churches, especially in doorways where betrothal and marriage ceremonies took place, be linked with magic to bless the union, protect the marriage from harm, and promote its fertility? I haven't got time to fully address this question here, but their similarity in many ways to profane badges does deserve mention and future consideration. This paper has raised more questions than answers. Can we find evidence for medieval love magic in the archaeological record? Can archaeology contribute to the wider literature on medieval love magic? I would argue tentatively, yes. Archaeology, archaeology allows us to reach areas of medieval life that are difficult to reach through text alone. Magic was part of everyday life in the Middle, uh, Middle Ages, and love magic was the most popular genre. I've highlighted three types of object that could have, have a connection to medieval love magic. Dress accessories exchanged during courtly love rituals, profane badges and shilas. All these objects deserve further study, away from simplistic, apotropaic and didactic interpretations. An archaeological uh, interpretation that considers their context, agency and materiality, as well as their iconography, would be beneficial to further enhance understanding of these understudied and undervalued objects. Thank you.